Shri Chaitanya and all these things that we can do in Luka, that is fine in Luka, Kadamma Yama Dhat is fine in Luka. Mom Vishnu Bhavai Krishna Prasad, Luka Vain Shimati Bhakti Vedanta, just down in the middle. Namaste, Jaya Shakti Devi, Gauru Vani Prachari, and then she was a Samurai, as that maybe was entirely. Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Kiranda, she had waiting a dark hour, she was a war, but the women, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. From the Srimad Bhagavatam, the third canto, 21st chapter, I'll read one verse. This is called Conversations Between Manu and Kardama. And uh, we'll read some of the verse, and we'll read the verse and read some of the purport. Kadvadayam Chajivesu Dadvajavayam Atmavan Mayatmanam Sahajagat Raksayatmani Chapi Chapinam. This is Kapila Day, the incarnation of the Lord. Um, speaking. <clears throat> <clears throat> Showing compassion to all living entities, you will attain self-realization. Giving assurance of safety to all, you will perceive your own self as well as all the universes in me and myself in you. Showing compassion to all living entities, you will attain self-realization. Giving assurance of safety to all, you perceive your own self as well as all the universes in me and myself and you. So I read the simple process of self realization for every living entity is described here. First principle is to be understood that in this world is a product of the supreme will. There is an identity of this world with the Supreme Lord. Hmm. This identity is accepted in a misconceived way by the impersonalists. They say that the Supreme Absolute Truth, transforming himself into the universe, loses his separate existence. Thus they accept the world and everything in it to be the Lord. This is pantheism, where everything is considered to be lo the Lord. This is the view of the impersonalists, but those who are personal to those who take everything to be the prophet of the Supreme Lord. Everything we, whatever we see is a manifestation of the Supreme Lord. Therefore, everything should be engaged in the service of the Lord. This is oneness. And then we'll go on. The difference between the impersonalist and the personalist is that the impersonalist does not accept the separate existence of the Lord. But the personalist accepts the Lord. He understands that although he distributes him, the Lord distributes himself in so many ways, he has his separate personal existence. This is described in Bhagavad Gita. I'm spread all over the universe in my impersonal form. Everything is resting on me, but I am not present. There's a nice example regarding the sun and the sunshine. The sun by its sunshine is spread all over the universe and all the planets rest on the sunshine. But all the planets are different from the sun planet 
How can they say that because the planets are resting on the sunshine, these planets are also the sun? Similarly, the impersonalist and pantheistic view that God is, that everything is God, is not a very intelligent proposal. The real position, as explained by the Lord himself, is that although nothing can exist without him, it is not a fact that everything is him. He is different from everything. So here also the Lord said, you will see everything in the world to be non-different from me. This means that everything should be considered a product of the Lord's energy. And therefore everything should be employed in the service of the Lord. One's energy should be utilized for one's self-interest that is the perfection of the energy. This energy can be utilized for real self-interest if one is compassionate. A person in Krishna consciousness, a devotee of the Lord, is always compassionate. He's not satisfied that only he is a devotee, but he tries to distribute the knowledge of devotional service to everyone. There are many devotees of the Lord who face many risks in distributing the devotional service of the Lord to people in general. That should be done. And now Prabhupada goes on to give a little more explanation of different kinds of devotees. It's also said a person who goes to the temple of the Lord and worships with great devotion who does not show sympathy to people in general or show respects to other devotees is a third class devotee. The second class devotee is he who is merciful and compassionate to the fallen souls. The second class devotee is always aware of his position as an eternal servant of the Lord. He therefore makes friendships with devotees of the Lord as, acts compassionate towards the general public in teaching them devotional service and refuses to cooperate or associate with non-devotees. As long as one is not compassionate to people in general in his devotional service, he is considered a third-class devotee. A first class devotee gives assurance to every living being that there is no fear of material existence. Let us live in Krishna consciousness and conquer the inertions of the material existence. It is indicated here that Kardama Muni was directed by the Lord to be very compassionate and liberal in his household life and give assurance to the people in his renounced life. A sannyasi, one in the renounced order of life, is meant to give enlightenment to the people. He should travel, going from home to home to enlighten. The householder, by the spell of Maya, becomes absorbed in family affairs and forgets his relationship with Krishna. If he died, there dies in forgetfulness like the cats and dogs, and his life is spoiled. It is the duty of a sannyasi, therefore, to go and awaken the forgetful souls with enlightenment of their eternal relationship with the Lord and engage them in devotional service. The devotee should show mercy to the fallen souls and also give them the assurance of fearlessness. As soon as one becomes a devotee of the Lord, he is convinced that he is protected by the Lord. Fear itself is afraid of the Lord. Therefore, what has he to do with fearfulness? To award fearlessness to the common man is the greatest act of charity. So it says here, to award fearlessness to the common man is the greatest act of charity. So this world is characterized by fear. From the highest person in the material existence down to the lowest, the element of fear exists. Uh, we even 
we see Indra. Indra becomes disturbed when he sees someone performing great austerities and penances. He thinks that, that by, by this endeavor, this person is going to become qualified and take his position as king of heaven. When Maharaj Pritu was performing uh, Asvamedha Yagyas, uh, he had performed 99. And there's only one that was injury. He had performed 100. So Indra was thinking, if he does one more, he will be equal to me and he might he probably will get my position. So out of this fear of losing his position, he stole the, uh, the sacrificial horse and ran away with it. Uh, Prita's son was aware of what was happening and chased after Indra and brought the horse back. Uh, Rita began the sacrifice again and Indra in disguise again, this time in disguise as a sannyasi appeared and again stole the horse. And Prithu's son again chased down Indra and brought him back. And this time Brahma intervened and uh, settled the whole situation and asked Prithu not to do the hundredth one like that. So um, here's an example of the king of heaven whose uh, opulence is, cannot be measured by people on this planet, but still he's fearful of losing his position. Um, people who have great wealth, they are fear, fearful of uh, their wealth being stolen or people coming to ask them for money or trying to arrange so many plans to keep their wealth and to protect it in so many ways. So they're always fearful. Fear is so much so that sometimes people will be in their own house and all of a sudden all the lights will go off and it'll be in the evening time and everything will be so dark one cannot see anything. So knowing, everyone knows what's in my house, but yet because of the darkness, people become fearful just by the element of being in darkness. And of course, the famous Shakespeare said, yes, there is the rub, referring to death, the ultimate principle of fear. Everyone is afraid of losing their mortal body. So fear is one of the characteristics that is very uh, prominent in the material existence. Okay. But here it says, to award fearlessness to the common man is the greatest act of charity. And here how it appears that it's done. A sannyasi or one who is in a renounced sort of a life should wander from door to door, village to village, from town to town, from country to country, all over the world, as far as possible and travel and like the householders about Krishna consciousness. A person who is a householder and is initiated by a sannyasi has a duty to spread Krishna consciousness home. As far as possible, he should call his friends and neighbors to his house and hold classes in Krishna consciousness. Holding a class means chanting the holy name of Krishna and speaking from Bhagavad Gita or Srimad Bhagavatam. There are immense literatures for spreading Krishna consciousness and it's the duty of each and every householder to learn about Krishna from his sannyasi spiritual master. And then it goes on to explain that the household duty is to earn money 
and also distribute money in proportion to the amount of money they have, giving some to the Krishna consciousness movement, some for family affairs, and some to be saved for emergency. Like that. It's an interesting verse in that there are three levels of devotees, Kanista Adhikari, Manjya Madhikari, and Uttama Adhikari. Kanista Adhikari, we heard, they're simply satisfied with their own practice of Krishna consciousness. They don't really associate with or have any inti intimate relations with other devotees. They may do their own worship and uh, they may have a spiritual master and uh, they're also envious by, about those who are in the higher ashrams. Mm -hmm. The second class devotee is called Madhyaman Arikari and then we understood, we heard what is a Madhyaman. Madhyaman is a person who worships the, the Supreme Lord in devotion, makes friends with other devotees, um, shows compassion to the fallen conditioned souls by giving them Krishna consciousness, and avoids the atheistic non-devotees, or those who are against spiritual life. <laughs> And then, of course, we have the first class devotee. He's called Uttama Adhikari. He is fully absorbed in Krishna. Uh, the characteristic is the Uttama. He doesn't preach because he doesn't see anybody who needs preaching. He sees himself as the lowest, and he sees all other devotees, all other people, not only devotees, everyone, more advanced than him, therefore he doesn't preach. Um, those who are great spiritual masters, many of them are coming from the first class platform and they come down to the second class platform in order to preach. We, we just like when we say the Prana Mantra of Srila Prabhupada, or not Prana Mantra, when we chant the Pranams or the Prem Dwani prayers, Prem Dwani prayers, we say, Jayam Vishnupad Paramahan Sapariva Jakacharja, Astotara Sattva Sri Sriman, His Divine Grace AC Bhakti Vedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. I'm sorry, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. And uh, so in that uh, statement, we hear Jayom Vishnupad Paramahansa Parivajakacharya. So Paramahansa is the highest platform first class devotee and Parivajakacharya is the second class. Parivajakacharya means one who travels and preaches everywhere. So we have two things. The first and second are mentioned in the pranam and the mantra glorifying the great souls because they are coming from the highest platform down to the second in order to make discrimination between devotee and non-devotee for the sake of preaching Krishna consciousness. But the one on the highest platform doesn't preach because they see everyone in a more better position than them. That cannot be imitated, nor can it be imagined. It comes by realization of one's advancement in Krishna consciousness. And so those great souls who are spiritual masters, who are fixed, in the process of Krishna consciousness. Many of them are coming from the first class platform down to the second for the sake of preaching. But the second class platform is the platform 
where our society, International Society for Krishna Consciousness, is situated. You, Prabhupada condemns or uh, rejects those on the third class platform, those who are simply interested in their own spiritual advancement and do not associate with others and are envious of others also. They do not preach. Um, they may worship the deity, they may also have a spiritual master, but they're called Prakrita Bhaktas or materialistic devotees. <laughs> so therefore, it's been emphasized constantly that one should practice Krishna consciousness on the second class platform. And this is the platform that everyone should aspire to be on, to should give our love to the Lord and devotion, make friends with other devotees, uh, preach to the non-devotee, those are innocent, give them Krishna consciousness and very carefully avoid the, the atheistic, uh, envious, uh, materialistic persons. And so nectar of instructions is, I think, one verse, verse number five, number six, I think, five or six, I think it's number one or five or six, describes these three kinds of devotees and the characteristics of each. Okay. So we are a uh, movement for expansion. And we're not a movement where we're what they call a chapati flipping movement. We sit and our temples have enough chapatis and sabji and everything is going on. And we don't care about everybody outside. We're happy. We got our building. We got our uh, worship. We got our prashad. And that's not our movement. This is the downfall of Christianity. Christianity was a very uh, dynamic movement many decades ago, maybe a hundred years ago. But after some time, it started losing its uh, potency because it became too institutionalized and started to pull back from the general population and started to become more insular, more, uh, what we say, sectarian and relegated their activities to festivals, to their immediate congregation like that and had their programs for uh, welfare work in the world. And it's still like that today. That's why what Prabhupada, in one lecture I was just listening to it yesterday, he said, you know, the Christians are closing all the churches because nobody's coming. Therefore, he said, we have, uh, we have this church in Los Angeles. They sold it to us because nobody is coming. And also in, in Toronto, we have a huge building, which was formerly a church in Toronto. So a lot of the churches that were, formal, that were formerly Christian churches are now Hare Krishna temples. <laughs> Prabhupada said we also worship Jesus Christ. Prabhupada said we can keep a, uh, a morti of Jesus Christ on our altar also. <laughs> so the Christians, when they come and see, they will say, oh, you are also worshiping Jesus Christ. Yes, we worship him as a great devotee of the Lord. We also honor him. Unfortunately, our do our temples are not doing that for whatever reason, but Prabhupada said it could be done, but it has to be done in the right way. So yeah, these are uh, some principles that we can think about. So uh, try to expand this movement to your immediate friends and family members, and then from there, take it out to the general population. Um, although right now we're in a very 
a restricted time period about how much we can do because of this, um, uh, when you say excessive, unnecessary fear that's being permeated about this COVID. The fear is that people, they're, they're just every day, the countries are coming up with more and more restrictions to limit people's interactions, to slow down public activities, to do so many things where people are more isolated. Yesterday, our devotees went out on Harinam Sankirtan to a nearby town outside of Ljubljana. And um, they had tremendous results. People were eagerly taking the books, giving donations, and thanking the devotees for, for coming. It was a, it was, the devotees were received so nicely in Harinam. So we can still do Harinam in some places and intellectually in most places because as long as we follow some basic restrictions, Harinam still is a very powerful way to spread Krishna consciousness. And uh, especially now people are a little bewildered, lost, uh, under a little bit uh, People are saving money, they're not spending money. Economy is going down. Um, people are uh, not sure about positions, jobs in the world anymore. And so there's this uh, fear of insecurity, fear of uncertainty that's being permeated, permeated along with this, the fear of disease. So it's a great time to preach. Each and every devotee can start their own Zoom conference and invite people to come on the Zoom, give class, and talk about Krishna consciousness, like that. And there's hundreds of ways, you can, not hundreds, but there are dozens of ways you can think of ways to reach the conditioned souls with this message of Krishna consciousness. Those of you who have the talents of writing can write articles and have them published in different ways. Um, start news newsletters, write books. And therefore preaching is, what we say, uh, a thing that can't be stopped by the materialistic society. We can always find ways to preach because Lord Chaitanya has empowered his devotees with the move, with the mercy of spreading Krishna consciousness, especially through the chanting of the Hare Krishna Mana Mantra. So this is a nice verse. Third Canto, 21st chapter, verse number 31, uh, describing what is a second class devotee and what are the activities performed by second class devotees? Okay, so we'll stop here and see. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glory to you, Maharaj. I have a question, Maharaj, uh, about the class of the devotee. How does a devotee knows that uh, uh, he's he or she is progressing from Kanishtha to Madhya Madhikari, um, at to first, from uh, third to second level, second class of devotee? And um, is it okay for a devotee to think that he's he or she is in the second class? Or it's always better for a devotee to think that. Uh, he is still in third class and he needs to, he or she needs to improve to come to the second class. Well, the second class is characterized by symptoms. How do you know when you're sick, you show, you show certain symptoms of the disease. The doctor analyzes the patient, sees the symptoms of the disease, takes some tests and, and concludes this is the disease. So in the same way, 
each of these cat each of these uh, categories have certain characteristics or symptoms. So we mentioned the symptoms of the second class. Eager to make friends with other devotees. Um, worships the Lord in devotion. Doesn't cooperate with the non-devotees, atheists. And uh, finds ways to distribute Krishna's, Krishna's mercies to the to others. So based on those symptoms, you can see. Okay, thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. And about uh, thinking, like, can a devotee think that he, she, or she has reached to the second, second, second class, or? It's always, always, always good to think that uh, she or she, she needs to still improve and come to the second class and uh, keep improving, basically. Yeah, we're always trying to improve, but the devotee always understands that without the mercy of the Lord, I'm nothing. No matter what level of practice you're on, we give all credit to the Lord's mercy. And the devotee always thinks I'm very fallen. I have no devotion. I have no intelligence. But somehow, by the grace of the Lord, I'm going on. So, when the devotee does something and some benefit is obtained, the devotee thinks, oh, my, my dear Lord, by your mercy, everything happened nicely. Devotee's natural humility uh, is understood in the form that they never take credit for what they do, but they always give credit to the spiritual master, to the assembly of Vaishnavas, to the Lord. That's very nice answer. Thank you so much, Maharaj. That was very nice. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna everyone. Hare Krishna Maharaj, my humble obeisances, all glories to Shri Prabhupada and all glories to yourself, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Shilpa. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, you mentioned uh, fearlessness and um, it reminded me of chapter 15 in the Bhagavad Gita, how it mentions that um, we have so many entanglements in this material world and um, how it's compared to the banyan tree. And I found that really interesting because we find that we're entangled in so many ways and we're still at the lower part of the branch. Marge. Um, I read in the same chapter that um, the only way that we can alleviate this entanglement is by devotional service and the Vedas. Um, so my question to you, Maharaj, is it um, purely just devotional service that will get us there? Um, well, when you understand what devotional service is, and you understand that the answer is yes. The uh, devotional service encompasses the complete mercy of the Lord. Devotional service uh, is characterized by being auspicious in all areas of existence. Everything is wonderful by devotional service. As we mentioned, we read yesterday, the highest activity in human society is to engage in devotional service to the Lord. So it's auspicious, it's purifying from material existence, it elevates the consciousness to the spiritual realm, it brings joy, it brings knowledge, it brings our, it brings association with the Supreme Lord. When you speak of that devotional service, it's, it's, it's a nice, these two words encompass the essence of, of, of life's practice, existence. But then again, there are different levels of devotional service. Pure devotional service is actually devotional service. 
when devotional service is mixed with something material, then it becomes less pure and still is auspicious, but not in the complete sense of its uh, essence. So there are 81 ways that devotional service can be um, uh, mixed. And there's one pure way, and that's pure devotional service. Three modes of material nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance. Nine processes of devotional service. Three, nine times three is 27, multiplied again by three. You have 81 ways that devotional service is impure or less than pure. But then above that, you have sattva, pure devotional service. And so Rupa Goswami explains the definition of pure devotional service. We mentioned it yesterday. <clears throat> Pure devotional service must be free from the desire for fruit of activities, gain through fruit of activities, gain through philosophical speculation, must be for Krishna, and must be with the desire to please Krishna. That is pure devotional service. So anything that is mixed or less than that definition that's been given is devotional service that's mixed. And most of us are performing mixed devotional service. Okay. And then in, in the Bhagavatam explains there's mode devotional service in the mode of goodness, devotional service in the mode of passion, devotional service in the mode of ignorance. Devotional service in the mode of ignorance means I'm using devotional service so I can become powerful, so I can destroy my enemies. I have enemies and I want to use my spiritual power to destroy them. That's devotional service in the mode of ignorance. One performs devotional service in the mode of passion means I'm performing devotional service to increase my material happiness and material facilities. And devotional service in the mode of goodness is I'm performing devotional service and, and I want to be known as a great devotee. I am, uh, <clears throat> there is still some desire for uh, profit, adoration, distinction, <clears throat> uh, and more subtle forms of contamination, which is, hard to detect. <clears throat> and then there's pseudo-sattva, pure devotional service. And that's free from any of the effects of the material energy. And that's, that's, that's the definition that Rupa Goswami gives. For Krishna, with a desire to please Krishna, free from any desire for any gain anywhere, for one's personal self. So yeah, if you can perform devotional service, the greater, the more pure, pure you're performing devotional service, the more everything becomes auspicious. So Marge, when we start reading, um, always we start with good intent. Uh, you just, when you do start something, I don't think you have a bad intention. Um, so if you do commit uh, some sort of offense, um, sometimes it's not intentional, Maharaj. It just happens um, that you've had a bad thought while you're reading. Um, is that forgiven? Because the sincerity is there. It's just the mind sometimes goes off track. Um, do you just bring oh. it back? Yeah, let me, uh, let, me, let me read you a verse to answer your question here. Because I like this question. I was going to, this is actually a good subject matter for a discussion. Let me see if I can find this verse. I think I know where it is. Can I? 
Coming closer here. Let's see if this is it. So the verse, it says, I'll read the translation, but the purport is where the answer is. Maharaj Parikshit was a realist, like the bees who only accept the essence of a flower. It was perfectly well that in this age of Kali, auspicious things produce good effects immediately, where an inauspicious acts may be actually performed to render effects. So he was never envious of the personality of Kali. Okay, it's purport. The age of Kali is called the fallen age. In this fallen age, because the living entities are in an awkward position, the Supreme Lord has given some special facilities to, to them. So by the will of the Lord, a living being does not become a victim of sinful activity, sinful act until the act is actually performed. Okay, by the will of the Lord, a living being does not become a victim of a sinful act until the act is actually performed. In other ages, simply by thinking of performing a sinful act, one used to become a victim of the act. On the contrary, a living being in this age is awarded the results of pious activities simply by thinking about them. So here's a special concession. In this age, if you think wrongly or sinfully, you don't get the reaction for that. That's a special concession. In other ages, what you thought badly, you would get the reaction. But not in this age because the age is so fallen. But one gets the benefit of thinking good in this age. So this is a special concession of the Lord in this age. So, but the idea is if bad thoughts do come or wrong thoughts come, one should be diligent to recognize it immediately. I say immediately with emphasis. Remove the thought from the mind and replace it with something spiritual, something auspicious, or something not, not sinful. The problem with sinful thoughts or wrong thoughts is that if they stay in the mind, they can grow. They will grow. And they can come out in the form of words or actions. But as long as they don't come out, they are, there is no reaction for that sinful thought. Okay, this is, this is chapter 18 of Canto 1, verse number 7. You can read the verse. It's very interesting. Thank you, Marsh. That gives solace. Mm -hmm. Sometimes thoughts do come in the mind and we know it's wrong. Um, but um, I think the, the main thing is to carry on and not give up. So thank you. That really helps, Marsh. Yeah, there's no reactions, but the idea is to remove them. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Marsh. That's, Chris, that's Krishna's special concession for us. Otherwise, we'd be finished. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All goes to Srila Prabhupada, all goes to you, Maharaj. It is Nimisha here. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, I've got a question. Reading the same canto, um, chapter 29, I've read it in somewhere there, I think it's a text 16, where Prabhupada says that uh, one should renounce from the mode of goodness. Um, so I understand when it comes to devotional service, um, one should try and get 
beyond the three modes of material nature, including mode of goodness. But, but, but when it comes to preaching, Maharaj, if we don't have goodness, how do we preach? Well, you know, you know what the goodness is, the mode of goodness is, is characterized by certain qualities. The mode of goodness is a stepping stone or a platform where one raises themselves up and then goes to Sudhasattva, pure goodness or transcendental. You can preach without being in the mode of goodness. Or you can even preach in the mode of passion. But your preaching will not have so much effect. The more purified you are, the more the effect your preaching has. But that doesn't relegate one to not preaching because you're not. So mode of goodness means, I think your understanding of the word goodness is a little bit material. The word goodness means that there is, uh, there is freedom from personal uh, gain on the, on the gross level. Still, the mode of goodness has gain on the subtle level. So that's what it means in terms of the, its characteristics. And you can read about that in, this, in the uh, Srimad Bhagavatam in the third canto. I think you're probably in the same area where you. So, yeah, go from the mode of passion to the mode of goodness, and then from mode of goodness, go upward. But one can preach in any level according to one's level of understanding and realization. Preaching has two ways to be defined. One, you can repeat what you heard from your spiritual master or what you heard from Krishna from the scriptures. Or you can uh, understand the philosophy and explain it in your own terms and that is more, what we say, advanced form of preaching because one is using their intelligence to place, to understand the philosophy in a practical way according to the situation and speaking accordingly. <laughs> I think we discussed that in one of our discussions that one should be able to explain the, the, the knowledge in the scriptures in your own words. But in your own words means according to what is the meaning of the text and not creating some new ideas. Mm -hmm. so you, anyone can preach, there's no problem. Mm -hmm. I think Maharaj, I misunderstood where in the purport he says that um, for, for the materialistic people whose, um, whose consciousness is still covered, we should especially try and be not, um, we should renounce from their association. This is 329.16? Yes, Maharaj, 329.16. And it's in the middle somewhere, the paragraph, um, I think it's the fourth paragraph from the start. But the analogy of, um, we should be friend and offer special respect to person who, are developed in Krishna consciousness, that paragraph, Maharaj. What is it, what's the point that's being made? So the point in here, um, I'll read it out, Maharaj. It says, other living entities are undoubtedly, undoubtedly part and parcel of Supreme Lord, but because their consciousness is still covered and not developed in Krishna consciousness, we should renounce their association. So? So that's where I thought that if they are not Krishna conscious, we should not try and not be in that association, but then preaching becomes difficult. That's what I was getting a little bit. Uh, the understanding is what does the term association mean? And that's another, you, uh, association means affection for. So mm. you can, if you take their association, then you go down. If you give them your association, they go up. Yes, Maharaj. Now they're, I get it. 
Yeah, there's the idea. So if you listen to all of their values and all their activities, and you become what we say attracted to that, then your consciousness becomes disturbed and you start mm -hmm. falling from your spiritual understanding. So association means affection for. Hmm. And you can be a, just like we go to the shop to buy something and we meet the merchant. Well, we might be friendly to the merchant, but we're not associating with them. The, the business is to exchange money for goods. So there's no association there. Hmm. But if we're in, if we're with people and they give their values and their life activities and we accept them and listen to them, we're taking their association. If we give them Krishna, devotional service, then they are associating with us. So that's what it means to preach, to give, give Krishna in the form of your association. Hmm. Thank you, Maharaj. It's very clear now. Okay, thank you. Hi, Krishna Guru Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Sri Prabhupada and all glories to yourself. Um, I have a question about karma. <clears throat> Yesterday, we're still reading about the uh, what happens when people take, uh, when people leave the body, we're in the third canto also, uh, but we're in, I think in the 30th or 31st chapter. Um, I was understanding that let's say um, a man has a family and he, uh, he owns money by illicit means and the, the family is uh, benefiting from that illicit money. And, and he may have killed someone, but in this, it's, you know, to get that money, let's say the family is unaware of this, of the fact that he's obtaining this money in an illicit fashion. Why is, I understood from the purports that the family has to suffer for the sin of that individual it may not be directly but it's indirect and it seemed um now i don't think this is wrong to say it seemed unfair to because the other parties were unaware of what he was doing and so i thought well why does do the, does the family have to suffer and because of his misdeeds just by being in the family and uh, also well, yeah, let me just stop with that. Thank you. There, there's numerous, numerous examples of that, <clears throat> both in everyday life and in, and in the Shastras. Mm -hmm. The example that comes to mind is Mugrari the hunter. Mugrari the hunter was a, was a hunter who used to kill animals half. He would, cause, he would kill them so they would suffer and, and then watch them die suffering. Uh, Narada Muni came along and told him, well, why are you killing animals half? If you want to kill an animal, kill it completely. He said, this is my tradition. My parent, father taught me like this, and his father did the same thing. I'm doing it on. And then uh, Narada Muni told him, well, you know, um, well, give up give up this activity and uh, you know, killing animals. And he said, well, how will I live? And he said, well, um, yeah. uh, what will I tell my family members? Well, then Narada Muni, in order to make the point, he had the power to show him that in the future, these animals would come back and kill him and also, the, the sinful activities that come by killing the animals, they also go on to his family members. So he said to his, uh, 
he said to Mar McGregor, go ask your family members if they're willing to take the reactions of the sinful activities that you commit because you're bringing the animals to them for food. And so he did, and then they all rejected him. No, no, we're not going to take any. It's all, it's all yours. But that's, that's anyone who's connected, just like, I'll give you an example. A person robs the bank, and so he goes in there with the gun, steals the money, and uh, the, he gets in the car, the guy, there's a, his friend is then in the getaway car, and he drives away. And they drive to the hideout, and there's other thieves there. So they all to divide up the money. So they're all guilty of the crime. Although one man performed the crime, they're all guilty of the crime because they're all getting the benefit or the, the results of the activity of that one person. So even in law, they say, well, there's an accomplice to the crime, to the criminal, and they also get full punishment also in many cases. So that's true. Yeah. So yeah, if a person is committing a sinful activity and others are benefited by the results, they also get the reactions. Even if they don't. they were not complicit, because even that's if, the, the difference. Even if they don't know it, they get it. <laughs> wow. That's the way the results of sinful activities are. Anyone who's involved with the activity or the results in any form gets a portion of that sinful reaction, that karma. Yeah, there's many examples. I can tell you personal stories where, you know, persons have committed crimes, and Pujaris have committed crimes in the temples, and because um, they committed crimes in the temples by stealing the money from the from the deity or stealing the deity's jewelry, um, the whole village in the area where that person lives also gets a reaction, not only from the family members, but everybody in that area gets a reaction. That's a, so sinful activities are very awful per pervading. Just like now, I'll, I'll give you an example. So what is this COVID vi virus? So people are exploiting animals, killing animals. All the, all the, the viruses and all the plagues that have been throughout history is all about, you know, uh, exploiting animals. It's all about that. So now, um, so someone starts it, they kill bats, and a virus is caused, and it's spreading all around the world. And people are getting sick who have nothing to do with the activity itself. <laughs> Yeah, that's, good. that's a very good uh, explanation. That, that clears that up for me a little bit. It just seems it's unfair that that's the material world, I guess. No, it's not unfair because you're in the material world. You're, you're also going to be polluted by the material energy. So the idea is to keep yourself free from that by becoming Krishna conscious. If you're Krishna conscious, you're protected. Here, here's, where the, here's where the protection comes. Krishna will protect his devotees if they engage in devotional service. And if they follow the basic principles. Yes, I was, I was reading your um, the sections you told me to read yesterday. And I really enjoyed Yamaraj was telling the Yamadutas, you know, you can't touch these devotees. Because they're what exalt they're um they're they love Krishna and uh, they're protected because of they they oh and, and then he they said well what happens if they sin even though they're devotees and he said well they're protected because they're always chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra so. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it. 
<laughs> so just keep keep chanting. Keep chanting the Maha Mantra. That's that's the point. Thank you very much, dear Maharaj. Kalir Doshani De Rajan Asti Eko Mahagunaha Kirtana Eva Krishna Sian Mukta Sangam Padam Majat. There's one one uh, boon in this age of Kali which pushes back all the sinful activities. That is the glorification of the Lord by chanting his holy name. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare. This takes shelter of the holy name and worship the Lord in devotion. This world is like a very contaminated place. Very contaminating. One has to be very careful not to get infected by the contamination of this world. Okay, anything else? Mm -hmm. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. My humble obeisances to you. Hello, hello. Yeah. Yeah. Maharaj. Hare okay. Krishna. I can't catch up with all the, all the wonderful <laughs> pictures you're sending me. I got hundreds of pictures that I have to look at yet, but I'm going to look at them sooner or later. Yes, Maharaj. My, Maharaj, my question was um, related to the point that you made that, um, you know, Christian churches became empty because um, they became institutionalized and like um, become more focused on um, just their um, services that they were doing. So um, like I'm trying to understand um, like being at the temple and um, just taking care of the deities and making sure that everything is happening at the temple properly. That in itself like takes a lot of energy. So, um, I mean, what exactly does like, you know, that a preaching mean? Because I also see like preaching is at different levels. You know, some people go and distribute books and meet newer devotees every day some people are encouraging uh, devotees who have been in the movement uh, but they still need association to st uh, stay um, healthy in the movement um, so what what exactly does it mean like how do we know that we are actually doing what um, preaching takes like what is necessary uh, in relationship to? Uh, I mean, in relationship to your service as deity worship? Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, like for example, if somebody is uh, taking care of the temple, like, you know, mm -hmm. who, is, who is in that role of taking care of the temple, then um, how, how does one make sure that... Um, like how do how do we know that preaching is actually happening? What well, we, what would be the standard? Like you know how how would we gauge ourselves? Preaching means to turn a person towards Krishna consciousness. That can be done in different so many different ways, through your words, through your activities, through various uh, what we say collective activities. Yeah, so sometimes we use this definition. Preaching means to turn a person towards Krishna, bring them closer to Krishna, bring them bring them in towards Krishna consciousness. Just like being polite to people or respectful, being accommodating, being uh, kind. This is a form of preaching. Also. So follow the etiquette of a devotee and whenever the opportunity comes according to the service that you're doing, um, 
who can inspire people in Krishna consciousness, either through your words or through your activities. You're looking for something more specific? Um, I'm, I'm just trying to understand, like, you know, how it is to be done or how, like, you know, what would be a gauge for knowing, like, if we are doing it right? Because um, we, we um, it, it is very evident from Prabhupada's books that, you know, Prabhupada wants us to preach. But I'm trying to see how does that actually look like? Because there are so many different um, activities that we do and there are on so many different levels. Like yeah, so one, of the, one of the ways is, is our behavior. That's the basic principle of preaching. Uh, <laughs> the proper advice of behavior. And that's mentioned when someone asks Prabhupada, how can you tell a devotee? Prabhupada said, he's a perfect gentleman. She's a perfect lady. In other words, they give respects to all. So giving respects to others in a day-to-day -day life with others is, a, is actually a form of preaching because that respect is going to the soul. It's also going to Krishna, who's in the heart of that living entity. Mm -hmm. Behavior, culture, and then preaching can take the form of philosophical teachings, form of an inviting people to take part in Krishna conscious activities. It can be, uh, it can be take the part of giving people things to do in devotional service where they can actually participate in a direct. Mm -hmm. Preaching is, is not a limited thing. It's, 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 it's the consciousness of wanting to bring others to Krishna consciousness. From that consciousness, so many different activities can expand from that point. Mm -hmm. just, like, just like when you worship, dressing the deities. If you're dressing the deities so nice that when people see it, oh, they think, wow, this is so beautiful. That's preaching. Mm -hmm. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a consciousness. There's activities behind it also, but generally the consciousness is wanting to bring others closer to Krishna or wanting to bring people in towards Krishna. Mm -hmm. So if a person is taking care of the temple, you might say one of the persons is in the lobby where they meet the guests as other people come into from the lobby. So they greet the guests, they welcome them, they introduce themselves and they introduce the temple to uh, the guests and make them feel like, oh, wow, this person's so nice. And this place it seems to be so interesting. That's preaching. Mm -hmm. Yes, Maharaj, you brought out a very important point uh, which cannot be escaped. Um, the behavior of the devotee is most important. Yes, the, the most important, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sanatana Goswami glorified Haridas Thakur as being a preacher with ideal behavior. Mm -hmm. Yes, Maharaj. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm going to catch up on your on the darshan that you keep that you sent me. So don't yes. think or don't think I'm being I'm I'm not looking at them. I am, but sometimes they get a little backed up. <laughs> yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Okay, so.
Is our host still breathing? Yes, Maharaj, Hare Krishna. <laughs> breathing and listening, very nice answers. <laughs> I really like the last um, um, answer you, uh, you said to uh, Lavanya Mataji. It's so beautiful that behavior is very important for devotees. It's so important. It's, it's really nice to hear that. Does anyone else have any questions? Last, last two, three minutes, maybe. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maharaj, for your time. Really appreciate it. In your busy, busy schedule, you have been from last six months, you have been giving every day without absent. You've been giving us time. So it's just amazing. We can never thank you enough. The Prabhupada is giving us the opportunity. To, and so, by his mercy. Yes, this lockdown seems to be a, a blessing in the disguise. Like, maybe for us, not for everyone, but for us, it's just amazing to see, take your darshan every day. Otherwise, you always travel and it's just not possible to... We don't even know so many times where you are. <laughs> so, it's just... Amazing to see you every day and hear from you. Corona has become Karuna. Yes. <laughs> it's interesting, both terms that they use, we have a Sanskrit term. For Corona, we say Karuna. Karuna means compassion. And uh, for COVID, we say Kovida. Kovida means highly intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so maybe COVID is here for here for all of us to get knowledge from you and become highly intelligent. <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> I'm also trying to get some knowledge. <laughs> okay, so we'll see you all tomorrow, and. Uh, There'll be a little bit of a change in the schedule coming up starting on Sunday. And Tushar will, Tushar, our, our Maha host, <laughs> who, may, who may be here today or may not be. I'm not sure if he is. But if he is, uh, I don't think he is today. But he will introduce what's coming up starting next week. Sure, Maharaj. Thank you. That will be good okay, to hear. Okay, thank you. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Hello. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Thank you very much. Chamarani. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Adi. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you. Somadatri. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Thank you very much. Sri Devi. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you very, very much. Shani. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Thank you very much. Bhagavad Gita Arjuna City. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you very much. Vivek and Ansu. Thank you. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you very much. Hey, Manavananda. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, thank you. Anuradha. Madhvi. Namaj. Okay, I'll see you all tomorrow. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you, Anjali Mataji. Thank you, Shamarani Mataji.